Hello and welcome to Hemoglobin A1C and Diabetics. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the president of Ed for Nurses, where we empower nurses to become extraordinary. Check us out online by going to www.edfornurses.com. This is part of our two-minute EBP challenge. The two-minute EBP challenge comes out as an email every Friday right into your inbox and asks an evidence-based question. On Monday, you get the answer to that evidence-based question. As the name implies, this is two-minute EBP challenge, which means you have to be able to get the answer within two minutes. So it's short, it's sweet, it's right to the point, help you to stay up to date. Hey, another way to help stay up to date and to share some ideas with your peers is to sign up or go to Google Groups here and you can sign up or you can add to our 101 Nursing Tips. The 101 Nursing Tips is an online discussion and again it'll go to your email when people post new tips. So this is a great way to share nursing tips with each other and get some nursing tips from us. Well our nursing tip today is going to be on hemoglobin A1C. Now hemoglobin A1C is the amount of of glucose that is bound up to hemoglobin. Now, glucose is going to bind up to hemoglobin in the greatest concentration that ever was. In other words, the higher the concentration of glucose, then the greater the hemoglobin A1C. So, for example here, a patient's got a blood glucose level of approximately 125. That means that so many glucoses are going to bind up to hemoglobin. And what we're measuring is the amount of hemoglobin that is glycolated, or in other words, that has glucose attached to it. So in this case here, with a glucose level of 125, your patient would have a hemoglobin A1C level of approximately 6%. If, however, the patient's blood glucose level were to rise and, say, maybe go up to 240 milliliters per deciliter, then the hemoglobin A1C level would rise too. In other words, more glucose would bind to hemoglobin, causing the overall amount of glycolated hemoglobin to increase, which would be now maybe 10%. So the hemoglobin A1C tells us about our overall glucose control. In other words, what is the average kind of glucose that the patient is having? Now the way this works is that hemoglobin is going to bind glucose permanently, and it doesn't let it go. So it's bound up there permanently. Now the reason why this will not stay at 10% forever is because your red blood cells die and the more hemoglobin is made. So hemoglobin is replaced on a regular basis, bringing in brand new hemoglobin with no glucose attached to it, which is going to start to drop the hemoglobin A1C level, unless you have a chronically high blood glucose. Just to give you an idea, of what the hemoglobin A1C means as far as the patient's average glucose. In this study here, they found that the average glucose in our patient uh, on the right-hand side in millig milligrams per deciliter as associated with the hemoglobin A1C. So the A1C level 5 indicated an average glucose of about 97. Hemoglobin A1C level of 6, 126, etc. So you can see that our average blood glucose level is going up considerably with each percentage point on our A1C level. Well, it has been widely recognized that having a low blood glucose is associated with low complications in our patients. So we've taken this information, which was originally studied in surgical intensive care patients, and now we've applied it to every patient and say, well, every patient should have low blood glucose levels. Everybody should have their blood glucose maintained within a normal range of 70 to 110. Well, that's not always going to be the case. And in some patients, having a low blood glucose level will actually cause more complications. So let's take a look at that. Long-term complications of blood glucose tend to be directly and linearly related to the hemoglobin A1C. So there's a linear line between our hemoglobin A1C concentration and the number of long-term complications that are associated with diabetes. So certainly we want to have the lowest hemoglobin A1C level possible. But in some patients, like patients on dialysis or patients who have multiple comorbidities, and those kind of patient populations, then we run into problems. 
we run into some problems with having those low hemoglobin A1C levels. Now, the reasons could be that maybe having a low blood glucose level when the patient becomes dialyzed and has other electrolyte disturbances going on, that maybe that causes more stress to the body. Patients who have multiple comorbidities might need a higher blood glucose level, especially at certain times of the day or night, in order to be able to manage those. We don't really know exactly what the mechanism is. These patients are also going to be at a higher risk for hypoglycemia. That's one of the possible mechanisms. The patients on dialysis, patients with multiple comorbidities, may be at a higher risk for hypoglycemia, and maintaining a lower hemoglobin A1C level is actually going to lead to more problems. Well, in this study, they looked at patients who were on dialysis, so diabetic patients on dialysis, and they looked at their hemoglobin A1C, and they looked at their mortality. Now, you can see from the chart here the hemoglobin A1C is on the left, the hazard ratio, which is the risk that the patient's going to die, is on the right. So certainly we want to be as close to one on this as possible. And the patients in the range of 7 to 9, as their hemoglobin A1c, had the lowest mortality in this group. So maintaining low hemoglobin A1c levels actually increased mortality. Obviously, high hemoglobin A1c levels increased mortality too. So what can you do with this information? Well, we can do some teaching for our patients about their glucose monitoring, how important it is to maintain a normal blood glucose, but maybe the patient needs a more moderate target. Rather than going for a target between 70 and 110, maybe we need to raise that target up a little bit. The American Diabetic Association is now recommending 140 as the target for hospitalized patients so that we're not overdoing it and possibly bottoming people out. So the glucose target may need to be adjusted for our patients. Anti-diabetic medications, they found that patients in their study who had the best hemoglobin A1C levels were on the highest doses of anti-diabetic medications. The patients who had the worst, or in other words, the highest hemoglobin A1C levels, were on the fewest anti-diabetic medications. So maybe that's something that we need to work on with our patients. He says, my diabetic research shows that test subjects are 98% more likely to take their diabetic pills if the pills are covered in chocolate. <laughs> I would be. <laughs> so this is an area we can do some patient teaching on, too. Now, if you'd like to get more information from this article, you can find the article by going to Medscape.com, view article, 754050. It's a report done by Dr. Porth and colleagues. Diabetics on dialysis do better with a higher hemoglobin A1C level. If you'd like to get more nursing tips, you can get them sent right to your cell phone. This We send out a text every Wednesday, so just once a week, so you don't have to be worried about being bombarded with all sorts of texts that are going to eat up your text um, ratio or whatever you have on your cell phone. So you get a text once a week by going to nursing tips. You, you text in nursing tips to 86677. So in other words, in the two column, the two row, you put in 86677, and then in the body of your text, put in nursing tips, and you can start getting nursing tips sent right to your cell phone. Thank you for joining me for this week's two-minute EBP challenge, hemoglobin A1C level in diabetics on dialysis. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the president of Ed for Nurses, where we empower nurses to become extraordinary. Join us online by going to www.edfornurses.com. Thanks for joining me this week, and until next week, Bye now.